Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, show, this show, uh, whose title is called A Brief History of the Jewish People in France. Uh, today's uh, guest is Michael Westwood, who currently resides in Marseille. And uh, Michael Westwood is a tour guide and a historian, and he is currently married to Sandra, and has been married to Sandra uh, since uh, February. 2014, and uh, he is um, he is a, a buff on history. And today we will be dealing with and talking and discussing the Jewish people in France, and particularly um, the history of the Jewish people. So, um, Michael, uh, uh, it's, I'm glad that we have you as a guest, and um, and that you are talking about the Jewish people. Can you give us a bit of the credentials? that you have that you, you can share that, uh, that says that you know a bit about this subject and uh, are experienced about this subject. Thanks, David. It's always a, always a pleasure to, uh, to talk to you as well. As far as my credentials go, I read history at the London School of Economics in the early 2000s, and uh, I studied uh, French uh, as well as history. I moved to France uh, quite recently well, about seven years ago in 2014. And I've been residing in, in Marseille ever since. Um, I am, I suppose you could say, partially integrated to the Jewish community uh, here in Marseille uh, because my wife uh, is of uh, Tunisian Sephardic descent. And uh, I also, uh, before uh, um, starting to, uh, to work in the maritime industry and in shipping, um, I, I worked a few contracts uh, in the, the Ort School in Marseille. I'm sure that some of the, uh, the viewers of Call TV uh, might themselves be Ort educated, uh, especially if they've, they've spent time in Israel. That's good. Um, now, with regards to the Jewish communities, uh, let's start with the basics, okay? What archaeological evidence uh, do, uh, has been unearthed in France uh, and in Gaul, in France, with regards to the Jewish communities and, and the Jewish people? Well, the uh, the Romans invaded uh, invaded Gaul under under Julius Caesar. He actually uh, led a, a legion himself um, during the, uh, the invasion of Marseille, the siege of Marseille. Um, as far as archaeological evidence is concerned, uh, one of these was found um, not far from, from Avignon in the south of France, a, uh, an oil lamp with a depiction of uh, the menorah on it, which has led archaeologists to believe that the Jewish community in France was present from 70 AD. Um, there are many uh, foundation myths, as, as there are with, with Every uh, civilization and community. Uh, the most uh, the, the most popularized one would be the uh, the three ships myth. Uh, supposedly there was a ship which landed at Bordeaux, a ship which landed at Lyon, so it would have travelled inland via the Rhone, and a ship which landed at Arles uh, with uh, Jewish passengers aboard. Uh, not long after the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. Um, I can't really say that there's much historical evidence uh, for the, the latter, that is the ship myth. But as far as the, uh, uh, the oil lamps concerned, um, it's, it's, it certainly dates from before the fourth century. Um, and uh, if the depiction on it is, uh, is not just uh, um, a memory, a souvenir, then it's entirely possible that it dated from 70 AD, uh, immediately after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, now, as a result of this, obviously, <clears throat> the next question that needs to be asked and, uh, uh, and explored is, of course, the establishment of Jewish communities in uh, the south of France. Uh, and mm. in what way has that been manifested? Well, the south of France was a, a veritable melting pot for lots of cultures. Um, the entire Mediterranean basin, um, and this can be attested by the trade records, 
uh, had a sizable Jewish community um, from the New Testament uh, text. You, we know that there was a, a sizable Jewish community in Rome in, in the first century. Um, as far as uh, Jewish communities in France were concerned, uh, there was a sizable community in, in Montpellier and again in, uh, in Marseille. In fact, the, um, in, in Montpellier now, there's a, uh, uh, an institute, an educational institute, which is called the Maimonides uh, Institute, uh, named after the, uh, the, uh, the Jewish uh, philosopher and sage uh, Maimonides. Um, the, the practices of the Kabbalah um, were both conceptualized and hammered out in the south of France, in and around Montpellier. Um, and as far as Marseille is concerned, 10% of the population of the ancient citadel, and I'm talking about from the first century until the 10th, um, up until the, uh, the, the 16th century in 1501, 10% um, of the population of Marseille was Jewish. Well, now, can you please explain to our, uh, to to the audience what you actually what the intercultural exchange up until the 14th century is all about, and how that uh, uh, how that uh, drove the Jewish communities to uh, to have their identity in France? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> all of the all of the French ports um, were populated by Jews. There were there were. Uh, Jews living in, in all of the French ports, uh, especially in the, uh, the Mediterranean ports. And as you know, Marseille is a port city. Um, it has been uh, for 2,600 years when the, uh, uh, the Greeks set up a trading counter here. Um, the, uh, the Jewish people who lived in Marseille um, were, had many professions. Um, they weren't restricted up until the 13th century either. So um we're, we're not into the enforced um, uh, money lending uh, that took place uh, from the, uh, the 13th century onwards uh, in Europe. So it's, uh, the, the, it, it, it's essentially Jewish people occupied all professions uh, in Marseille and then there was an enormous amount of, um, of participation uh, in, in civic uh, occasions. Well, then we uh, we led to, of course, obviously the winds have changed leading up to the persecution, and presumably this persecution uh, leads on to a, another subject which we'll get into. Mm -hmm. So, uh, at what time did, did this uh, winds of change start to show itself, and at what stage in history did the persecution take place? I think variously um, there were there were several um, there were several occasions. Uh, whereby uh, persecution could have happened, um, and then several occasions uh, when French rulers, um, as with other rulers in, in Europe, uh, jumped on the occasion to enact anti-Semitic laws. Um, at this stage, uh, I would actually, I'd, I'd use the word anti-Jewish laws rather than anti-Semitic laws, uh, because at this point, um, there was nothing racial of, uh, in, in its nature. That came later. Um, but the, uh, uh, in 1215, you had the first, uh, you, you had the, the, uh, the Lateran Treaty, um, which uh, in a shorthand way, you could refer to it as the, uh, uh, the Treaty of the, uh, the Inquisition. Uh, this led to the, uh, uh, the weaponizing of the, the Inquisitions um, towards the, uh, the, the towards the Cathars, principally uh, in the south of France, um, leading to the uh, what was known as the Cathar tragedy. Uh, a million Cathars were were, were killed uh, during the uh, the Cathar Inquisitions, um, and and uh, well, we say Cathars, but we can also say Albigensians, um, Christians, Bible believing Christians who came from uh, from the city of Albi. Uh, and, and, and thereabouts. So there was the, the Latin Treaty of 1215, uh, which as well as laying out the roadmap for the Inquisitions in Europe, not just in France, but in Spain and elsewhere, um, also had a clause involving the, the wearing of a yellow, uh, a yellow circle. 
on, on, on your garments if you were Jewish. Uh, so this was the, the first demarcation, if you like, the first public um, singling out of, 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 of Jewish people. Um, now, some, some kings, some rulers uh, actually uh, executed this law to the letter and forced their Jewish subjects to wear a yellow circle on their garments. Um, most, most kings didn't. This, this didn't happen in a lot of kingdoms in Europe. Um, but in, in, 12, uh, in 1269, <clears throat> uh, King Louis, uh, Saint Louis, as he was known, King Louis the, uh, the Ninth, uh, decided to enforce this law, to, to force Jewish people to wear a yellow circle on their garments. So for me, this was a, the start of the singling out of the Jews, um, the start of a designation of other, as it were, um, whereas before there was uh, a, a certain integration and a lot of participation in civic life. Now we lead to another thing that happened, of course, and that is the Banishment Act of 1306. Now, uh, not much is known about this uh, in, in Britain, uh, and I'm pretty certain that a lot of people in other parts of Europe will not know about the Banishment Act. Can you please lay out what the Punishment Act is and how it was implemented and and indeed the effect that it had on, on the Jewish community in France? Yes, yeah, certainly. I think uh, when you talk about Philip Le Bel or Philip the Fair, most people will associate the name with the banishment of the Templars uh, in 1307, the following year. Uh, however, the same king also banished the Jews from France. Uh, the banishment of the Jews involved the banishment and the wholesale looting of a hundred thousand Jews from France. Um, they were expelled from the, uh, the Kingdom of France, as it was then, and they ended up in, in Spain, um, in, in Portugal and elsewhere. They also ended up in Provence, which until 1484, was a separate country, a separate kingdom. Now, I take it that this led to the contact Venetian or the papal Jews and the establishment of the Carreres or ghettos in Provence. Now, uh, I take it that that was the knock-on effect of the Banishment Act. I can't really say that there was cause and effect um, as far as the, uh, the, the, the banishment was concerned. The uh, the carrière, uh, which comes from a word in Provençal, which was the language spoken in the south of France in those days, um, were established already um, at the end of the 13th century. In 1274, I believe, the, uh, the Jewish community established itself in Avignon. The popes uh, came to live in Avignon, established their palace there, uh, by way of, uh, of uh, in fact, what they did was to, to annex an existing monastery, and they came and uh, resided there from uh, in, in, in 1315. Uh, the wholesale attribution of, uh, of, of, of living quarters and uh, um, ghettoization came came a lot later. Uh, would you like me to go into some detail about the? Uh, uh, the carrier, I, I can if you like. Yeah, well, that, that would be interesting. Um, yeah, just give us, fill us in with some of the, 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 the salient points of the carrier. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so the uh, the population, the the, uh, uh, the population of the uh, the, the carrier uh, was composed of uh, of people who'd been living in in France for hundreds of years, um, they, were, they were French Jews, um, uh, they were native uh, as, it, as it were, um, there was a small amount of people who were, um, who come over from, uh, from France and Portugal and Catalonia, um, but for the most part the people living in the Carrier were French Jews. Now uh, numbers fluctuated from, from 2,000 to, to over 10,000. 
Um, these people were living in, in, in four cities, principally. So they were living in Avignon, um, Cavaillon, ile sur la sorgue and Carpentras. Uh, these cities were known as the, uh, uh, the Arba Kehilot, so the, 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 four, uh, the four holy communities. Uh, the, the specificity of these of these cities, uh, their unique unique nature was um, that they were uh, situated in what was known as the Comtat Venaissan. Okay, uh, Comtat means uh, county. Uh, it's, a, it's a word in, in Provençal, in, and uh, it was uh, an area which were, which was the property of the papacy. It was. Uh, uh, previously sold to the uh, to the papacy, um, and this was, as I said, acted in 1315 uh, when when the papacy took uh, took control of Avignon, took possession of Avignon. Um, so in each of these cities, there was a designated street, um, Carrière means street, um, where the uh, the Jews of that town would live. Um, in the beginning, in the in the 14th century. You couldn't really call it ghettoization. The street, the, the people who lived there had the uh, the freedom to, uh, to to buy property, uh, to live um, in in the carrière, uh, but also to carry out their profession and trade with non-Jews. Um, and the only uh, the only restriction, although it was a very heavy restriction, and uh, wasn't altogether pleasant, was that there was a chain, um, a simple chain, um, which was posed on the, the entrance of the, of the, on the two entrances of the carrière at the end of the day, at sunrise. Um, the real segregation and ghettoization uh, started in uh, 1504. Um, this is when a door was placed at the entry of the carrière. Now, um, why did they do this? Why did they ghettoize uh, the Jews in these in these cities, in these towns? Um, what happened essentially was roaming uh, vine workers would uh, would come to Provence uh, from Italy and Spain and would whip up uh, anti anti Jewish uh, further um, in Cavaillon, in Carpentras, and in Avignon, and um, there would be uh, attacks upon the uh, the people uh, living in the carrier. So um, it was decided that doors would be put on the uh, on the carrier to to protect the inhabitants. Um, for me uh, personally, I'm a little bit uh, skeptical about that. Um, I think the uh, the 16th century was the the beginning of uh, a new wave of, of anti-Jewish fervor, and um, I think the uh, talking about the sort of knock-on effect um, and protection of the community uh, was a bit of an excuse um, for, for acting um, in a punitive way against this community. Now, as we've dealt with this, can you then take us through the uh, how this transition uh, from that period of time to the influx of Portuguese and Spanish Sephardim um, uh, following the Inquisition. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, there was a big influx of uh, um, Sephardic Jews into France uh, following the uh, the Inquisitions, which were unleashed in Spain in 1492. Uh, I suppose you could say, contrary to the expulsion of the Jews in France, the, uh, the Inquisition in Spain was 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 more of a wholesale uh, genocide. Um, the Jews flee to um, to first of all to Portugal, and then they were inquisited in Portugal as well. Um, and then when they came to France, they ended up uh, principally in in, in Bordeaux. Uh, some ended up in Marseille. And then were immediately uh, expedited to uh, to North Africa. So you've got in, you've got uh, you had at this point immense uh, Jewish uh, communities, Sephardic communities in in, uh, um, in, in North Africa. Um, 
the Sephardic Jews who ended up in, in Bordeaux uh, were given a special status. Um, the, as you may or may not know, in Spain um, there were uh, Jewish converts. Um, when I say Jewish converts, um, for the most part they weren't really converted. These were just forced baptisms. And when I say baptisms, I don't mean uh, full immersion in water, I mean sprinkling water on people's heads um, and, and forcing them to take a vow. Um, these people were known as the, uh, the Moranis, or pork eaters, um, and in, in, in France they were known as neophytes. Okay? So a small population uh, moved to, uh, to Bordeaux of, uh, of neophytes, um, and they became known as the Portuguese Jews. Whether they were from Spain or Portugal didn't really matter to the authorities in those days. Uh, they were simply labelled as the Portuguese Jews. Now, these people were given a royal letter of dispensation in order to reside in Bordeaux. And this was the case up until the, uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the subsequent revolution in 1789. Now this obviously is uh, um, it's quite an in-depth subject, uh, uh, but to deal with uh, another aspect of this was the special statutes according to the individuals and communities from the 15th to the 18th century. Uh, please give us a, a description of that uh, so that we can anchor our understanding into this period of time for Jewish people in France. Okay, yeah. Um, well, as I uh, as I just said, the uh, the uh, certain Jews, uh, the, the Jews in Bordeaux, um, were given were given the royal letter of dispensation. Uh, similar measures uh, were in place in Alsace, uh, in Provence. Um, the uh, there were certain exemptions to the draconian laws, uh, which were put in place uh, in the in, in the carrière as well. So from the 17th century onwards, um, Jews could in fact move from, from, from place to place. Um, they couldn't possess property, uh, but in villages um, which were uh, a proximity to the, uh, the papal, the, the, sorry, the assigned papal Jewish villages, um, apartments were put aside which could be rented out by Jews. Um, and they could also uh, stay outside after dark as well. And and what exactly was the reform under the Ancien Regime, uh, and how was that implemented? Okay, um, there was a there were real winds of change in the uh, in in the eighteenth century, and uh, from the seventeen sixties uh, onwards, uh, there were a lot of um, decrees and acts um, which were uh, strangely enough um, which were strangely enough created by um, by abbots and members of the clergy um, it was an atmosphere of of, uh, of of change it was the uh, of course uh, the beginnings of uh, what we call la lumière um, and, uh, and 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 that uh, uh, that phase in in, in philosophy, uh, political philosophy. Um, so uh, there were there were decrees uh, which were which were put in place um, to give Jewish people uh, the same rights as 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 Gentiles. Um, none of these were actually enacted as such until uh, until after the French Revolution. Well, that leads us to the reforms after the, the French Revolution, and uh, how was that implemented in France? Okay, um, there were the there were the consistories, which were uh, which were created, um, the sort of state-sanctioned synagogues. Uh, whenever there was a sizable Jewish community uh, in a town or um, in, in, in a part of the city, in a neighbourhood, 
um, they would they would uh, create what we call a consistory. Um, at the time of the consistories, um, anybody who wanted to play a part uh, legally in the in the Jewish community um, in in civil matters. Um, rabbis and uh, and others as well, any public figures in fact, um, and even just anybody who wanted to, uh, uh, to, to to carry out a profession in France, had to answer uh, what were called the 12 questions. Um, the 12 questions involved questions on bigamy, uh, such as, uh, in the Republic of France, uh, is it permitted a, for a man to marry uh, more than one woman. Now, to these questions, there were fairly staple replies, uh, such as, uh, uh, in the Republic of France, um, unlike in other countries, it is not permitted to marry more than one woman, etc. So these uh, these 12 questions were asked, uh, the answers were given, and um, the report was given for, for, for people to, uh, to carry out whichever profession they wanted to. And, and what progress was made uh, during the 19th century in France uh, that led to uh, to the Jewish community and its identity? Well, enormous progress was made um, to the extent that you had uh, uh, legislators such as Premier, whose, uh, whose ancestors actually came from the Carrière um, in the south of France. Uh, becoming part of the government and making laws. Uh, Crémieux uh, was uh, uh, the politician which drew up the uh, the law which gave Jews um, French citizenship in Algeria. Uh, this was this was a, a, a big uh, leap forward because uh, hitherto uh, Jewish people didn't have any status in Algeria. They didn't have a legal status. Um, you've you've got to you've got to look at this with with, with uh, keeping in mind bearing in mind that uh, um, there were Jewish communities in Algeria and Tunisia um, as far back as the uh, the Babylonian exile so the, these were historic Jewish communities and, uh, and as I said in 1870 they were afforded the uh, the right to the French citizenship Okay, now we we can then deal with and take us through to the reactionary po uh, politics and the Dreyfus affair. Now, I know that the Dreyfus affair was a major deal in France. And one of the reporters that reported the Dreyfus affair was Theodore Herzl, who was mm -hmm. instrumental in the Zionist movement for the dream to uh, give birth to the rebirth of the nation state of Israel. Can you please describe... Yeah. Uh, the reactionary uh, uh, period of time and politics and the Dreyfus affair and more or less in as, uh, in as, as succinct detail as is possible, describe exactly what happened there. Yeah, sure. Um, Dreyfus was an officer, a high-ranking officer, a highly decorated and high-ranking officer in the French army who was accused of espionage, falsely accused of espionage, um, and then he was extradited to uh, Devil's Island in, in French Guiana, uh, where he spent uh, four years from 1894 to 1898, um, until uh, his name was cleared. Uh, sorry, and, and, and then uh, the, the affair carried on until his name was cleared in 1906. Um, what led to this, you, you might ask? Um, there was an enormous amount of, of uh, uh, reactionary journalism which was being pumped out in the 1890s. It's a bit of a shame because um, the to, to illustrate the, the progress which had been made in France, uh, I'll give you this example. Um, during the first two trials of Dreyfus, the fact that he was Jewish wasn't even mentioned. So that's uh, that's something that's uh, that, that's interesting. Um, the the what, what what really what really made the uh, the what really gave the Dreyfus affair its venom uh, was a uh, a magazine called Free Speech, um, 
which was uh, which has been redacted in in, in Paris. Um, there was also La Croix, uh, which was the uh, uh, the, the, the French um, the French newspaper, which uh, the, the French Catholic newspaper. Um, these guys are really, you know, they, 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 they were pumping out very, very anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish feeling, uh, which wasn't necessarily um, present in France, certainly not in polite society at this time. And of, uh, and of course, obviously, this leads us to the Vichy and Saône uh, periods uh, and the occupation. And of course, obviously, this is now bringing us fully up to the World War II period of time. If you could describe in detail that um, uh, that transition from the Dreyfus affair through uh, the Vichy and so on uh, through to the occupation. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, Dreyfus's name was cleared in 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 uh, 1906. Um, there was then um, a period of of uh, a sort of resurgence of, of, of nationalism in the. Uh, in the 1920s and 30s, um, there was also a uh, at, at the same time simultaneously there was uh, a big influx of um, of Ashkenazi Jews uh, coming from from Eastern Europe. Um, this had been happening since the late 19th century. Um, so the anti-Jewish feeling, um, which wasn't really which didn't really exist in in the 19th century, um, mutated and mixed with the sort of uh, xenophobic um, fervor. So it was anti, it was both anti-Jewish um, and anti-foreigner. They were they were really against the uh, the arrival of, of uh, Jews from Russia, from Poland, and from Belarus. Um, this was also mixed in with uh, um, with Darwinism and, and, and social Darwinism, um, the, uh, the 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 historian um, Yuval Noah Harari um, once uh, he described uh, uh, National Socialism as untrammeled uh, social Darwinism. So, in in the poisonous mix of uh, of xenophobia. Um, and uh, an anti-Jewish uh, propaganda. You also now had this this notion of Jews being racially different. Um, this is when this is when anti-Jewish um, this is when uh, anti-Jewish rage uh, became anti-Semitic, um, and there was a great amount of resentment towards uh, any Jewish public figures, uh, such as uh, Leon Blum. Who was the uh, the leader of the uh, the Popular Front in France? He was actually ripped out of his uh, his his car publicly in Paris. Can you also so, explain? Uh, and yeah, can you explain also explain the arrival of the Puy Noir in uh, in Marseille and what Puy Noir means? Yeah, sure. I, could I just I'll, I'll just finish addressing the um, the situation with uh, Vichy. I'll, 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 I'll go over that because uh, I think that's something which can't be left out. Um, in, in 1940, uh, France, uh, France became uh, occupied um, by the, uh, the soldiers, the forces of the, uh, the Third Reich. And um, the, uh, the Vichy regime uh, took over a, um, a certain amount of territory in the south of France. Um, the Vichy regime was led by Marshal Pétain, who was um, a, uh, a marshal from the, uh, the First World War, uh, who, was, who was very highly decorated, very highly respected. Um, and uh, right from the inception of Vichy, um, anti-Semitic laws were put into place. Um, this, is where, this is where legislation in France, for the first time, uh, for the first time in its history, became anti-Semitic. Um, racial laws were put in place in France, uh, in Vichy France, in 1940. Um, there were foreign foreign uh, Jews from neighbouring countries who fled to France, 
um, following the uh, the rise to power of the Nazis. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 Vichy government advocated right from right from 1940 the deportation um, and the incarceration of, of foreign Jews. Um, they would subsequently pass laws to deport and incarcerate uh, French Jews. Um, I think the summum of this, the most tragic um, incident of the whole uh, the whole show of period in France um, was the uh, the incident of the Veldiv in Paris. Uh, the Veldiv, uh, Veldiv is shorthand, if you like, for the Vélodrome d'Hiver. In June 1942, uh, in the night of the 16th of June, in, in the early hours of the morning, um, the Jews of Paris were rounded up for immediate deportation to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Now, they, they rounded up 9,000 men and 4,000 children, uh, beginning at about 4 o'clock in the morning. They had soldiers bust in, uh, volunteers, I might add, from the south of France uh, to aid the Gestapo and the German occupiers in Paris. Um, in France, uh, 76,000 Jews uh, lost their lives, uh, were murdered in, in the show. Wow. And to get back to the point, so the arrival of the Prix de Noir in Marseille, yes. what, what is this chapter uh, about and how, uh, and describe the word Prix de Noir, what that means uh, and when this actually happened. Okay, Pied Noir, that means literally black feet. Um, it was a nickname uh, given to the uh, the the, uh, the French who lived in uh, who lived in Algeria and Tunisia and Morocco as well. Um, the French colonised Algeria back in 1830. Uh, uh, as I said, Jews were given uh, legal status as French citizens uh, in 1870. There was the outbreak of the. Algerian War of Independence in 1954, and uh, the uh, the Jews, along with the French, uh, started to exit the country uh, from 1954 onwards. Um, now, those who were repatriated to France uh, didn't just come from Algeria or Tunisia or Morocco. Um, the, the beginning of the, the great influx to Marseille especially was in 1956 um, during the, uh, the war in Indochina. Um, then the, uh, the, the French Algerians started to come back. Uh, they, they started pouring into France in 1958 and uh, in 1962 at the end of the, uh, the Algerian war after the declaration of, of, of independence um, there were around and about a million and a half uh, Pied Noir. Um, these were French-speaking people who'd lived in Algeria and Morocco and Tunisia, um, of French descent, of Maltese descent, of Spanish descent, uh, but also a sizable amount of, of Sephardic Jews as well. Um, Marseille's uh, Jewish population, for example, uh, grew from a few thousand to a hundred thousand in these years. So the, the Jewish community in Marseille is, is massively uh, Algerian and Tunisian uh, with, with all of the traditions uh, and customs that, that go with that. Well, let's bring us up to up to date now. We've had the Ilian Halmi and the Charlie Hebdo uh, attacks and of course, obviously, Charlie Hebdo uh, was a Jewish outlet um, in Paris, and this has this has given rise to some instability in France. Now, please describe what the current state of, of play is with the Jewish community and their reaction to what is actually happening in modern day France within their communities. Yeah, sure. Um, 
I was working. I was working. Um, I was working a temporary contract as a teacher uh, in in an art school, uh, uh, a Jewish school in in Marseille, um, back in 2015 and 2016. Um, the Charlie Hebdo attacks took place in um, in 2015, at the beginning of 2015, um, as did the attacks on the hyper uh the hyper kosher supermarket. Um, in which uh, five people uh, lost their, their lives. Um, there was it was it was a it was a, a very strange uh, it was a very strange period. Um, I remember going to work um, and greeting sentries uh, every day. There were sentries put in place. Who were actually sleeping in the school where I worked uh, on camp beds, um, and they were they were given uh, they were put on 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 post with uh, with submachine guns to protect the children um, and the teachers uh, who were being educated with the orb at that point. Um, I remember speaking. I, was, I remember speaking to the uh, uh, the head teacher of the school, and I said, "Well, at least." Uh, um, at least, at least the children are protected for now. And, uh, and she said, "Yeah, but what about when the soldiers leave?" Um, it was a very strange period indeed. Uh, the children were subjected to uh, confinement exercises, uh, whereby an alarm would be hit by the security officer of the school, the chief security officer, um, and then the children would be told to hide under their desks. Uh, the teacher would lock the door. Of each of each classroom, and um, a a recording of machine gun fire would be played um, over the sound system to emulate to simulate a uh, um, uh, a hostage a hostage situation. Um, it was one of the most surreal experiences in my life. Um, the what also happened in 2015. Um, which of course you're all, um, which of course you all know about, uh, was the Ninth Intifada. Uh, do you remember that, David? The Ninth Intifada. Um, I believe that that was a period of time in which I was actually having my two days downtime after my fourth trip in Israel, when yeah. a Palestinian went into a synagogue in West Jerusalem and stabbed and killed four rabbis on the Shabbat service at around about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. That's right, yeah. So the, the knife in the father in, in Jerusalem and in Israel uh, inspired uh, knock-on attacks in France. So um, from, from 2015... Uh, onwards, uh, there was a massive um, boom, if you like, a massive increase um, in Olin. People started to, uh, to, to, to make Aliyah to, to Israel. Um, the demographic change in, 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 in Tel Aviv, um, as you know, over the, past, uh, over the past five years has been dramatic, to say the least. There's a massive uh, uh, French-speaking Jewish community now um, in, uh, in in Tel Aviv, uh, both from Belgium and from France. Um, so it's it's it's, it's these, these uh, Islamic fundamentalist attacks have had um, a, a big impact on on on, on Jewish life in France. Um, some people stayed over there. I know people who, who came back. Uh, because life in Israel isn't isn't for everybody, um, but that's uh, that's that's uh, that's the situation as it is at the moment. Um, going back um, ten years before the Charlie Hebdo attacks, um, there was the uh, the attack on uh, on Ilan Halimi. Uh, that was back in two thousand and six. Uh, Ilan was a young a young man. Who was enticed uh, uh, by a, uh, a honey trap? Um, hun he was enticed by honey trap messages, um, and he was subsequently tortured by um, a, uh, a gang of, um, of Muslim extremists 
for 23 days. Um, he was he was beaten, uh, raped with a broomstick, um, and tortured in the basement of a uh, of, of, of a of a, of a council estate, of a, uh, what they call it, a, a cité in in France. Um, I think it's most one of the most uh, horrific. Uh, things that's happened in in modern French history, um, and it wasn't really publicised uh, in the uh, in the international press. Um, the uh, Ilan was he was found um, in in on on railway sidings uh, where he'd been where he'd been uh, burnt to death uh, by by his attackers. So just you know, there were some horrific, horrific things that have happened in in France um, over in 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 recent times. Um, the, the cemeteries have been desecrated. Um, Severn Cemetery was was desecrated. Um, synagogues have been have have, have been uh, have been burned. Uh, I had a, a colleague who was attacked. Um, as a direct result of the uh, of the knife intifada, and the young um, the young boys uh, who were educated at the Ort where I worked um, carried pepper spray with them wherever they went. Um, the uh, the chief rabbi, the head rabbi of Marseille, um, issued an order to all male Jews in Marseille um, in 2015 and 2016. He issued two orders, in fact, uh, for all male Jews. Uh, to to wear a baseball cap um, over the yarmulkes, over the kippers. Um, so this is this is what's what's been happening in France, and um, I I see it as as really quite unjust um, that this has had so little media exposure. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, for this um, this great presentation. Uh, on a final note, um, just give the audience um, a, a general feel of what it's like to be a Jewish person uh, living in a Jewish community in, say, for instance, your home city, Marseille. Yeah, well, I'd I'd, I'd like to uh, I'd like to end things on a happy note. Um, and uh, and I and I think it's entirely possible to do so. Um, as I said, my uh, my wife um, is of Sephardic uh, descent. Um, being a Jew in um, in France is as rich and wonderful as uh, as being a Jew elsewhere, and I might say even more so uh, because there there are so many wonderful cultural influences. Um, on on Jewish life here, um, my uh, my wife's aunt um, is an expert at uh, at, at, at making uh, Tunisian couscous. Um, she starts her Shabbat cooking uh, her Shabbat cooking spree. Sometimes it starts on a, as early as a, as a as a Wednesday uh, to give you an idea of how much uh, how long she uh, she prepares. Um, uh, for for the Shabbat, so um, uh, yeah, you you know you, you you can eat well here, that's for sure. Um, what what else is there? Well, um, there there is a, a presence of of a lot of different types of uh, uh, a, a lot of different Jewish communities uh, here in Marseille. Um, there there are Ashkenazim, there are Sephardim. Um, we have a sizable uh, uh, Lubavitch uh, congregation here in Marseille. There are liberal congregations. Um, it's it's a flourishing and wonderful. Um, it's a flourishing and wonderful life here for for Jews. Um, and there's a lot of exchange between uh, between Marseille and Israel. Um, and as far as French popular culture is concerned. Uh, there are a massive amount of, uh, of, of Jewish uh, performers uh, in, 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 in the music industry uh, and in public life in general. So um, I, I think that it's, uh, it's good to, 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 to stay strong, to, to, to be proud of, uh, of, of being Jewish, of being a French Jew, 
um, and not to be uh, not to be pulled down by um, by by hooligans. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and it's been a pleasure doing this show. Uh, and I hope our audience really enjoy this show and find it informative and a blessing. Uh, and it's good to have a a a a, a gauge. Uh, with regards to the history of a particular people in a particular nation of which, broadly speaking, there's a lot written about, but not much publicised about. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. And uh, may you enjoy the rest of the day. And uh, thank you to the audience for joining. Till next time. Goodbye. Thanks, David. Bye.